Bene, bu- Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome you all here. Let's give a warm welcome to Federico Trinquero. Let's greet him with a warm applause. Father Federico is a friend coming from a faraway place that is unknown to the majority of us. Central African Republic, that's the place. And the name helps us indeed. We can have an overall overall idea looking at the name. It is in the middle of Africa. But actually, what Central African Republic is and what Bunky is, well, I don't think that many of us know about those places, and very few of us have heard about those places. Last year, an important event took place there. We don't know Central Africa, and up until last year, we've only heard something regarding uh, a common feature of those area. In 2012 and 13, a spark of rampaging war, civil war, uh, started. A coup d'etat and uh, more than 600,000 refugees fled the country. That's a scenery that we've witnessed very often and unfortunately, Very often, newspapers describe that as a religious war. It's very easy to describe such situation as a war uh, between the Muslims and uh, Out of the blue, that situation was completely a mess. And the intervention of the French army and uh, the UN intervention helped a bit. But Father Federico will tell us that part of the flow of refugees was looking for hope and a refuge, a shelter in uh, his church. We have heard about this situation in bits and pieces up until a certain moment last year. We will see a video regarding that moment, please. Bangui deviene la capital espiritual del mundo. Era la fine di novembre del 2015 e di fatto il Papa... That was the end of November in 2015 and the Pope opened the holy door in Bangui Cathedral, thus opening the uh, year of mercy. Even before opening the holy door in uh, St. Peter, that became the spiritual capital city of the world. So what we would like to hear from Father Federico, 39 years old, uh, that 
spent so many years in uh, Central Africa since 2009, and he teaches students inside his um, church, Carmelite Church. Well, I would like to ask him why did Bangui became become the capital, the spiritual capital of the world? What happened that led to such happening? Why is that place so significant? Please help us in understanding and knowing more about this huge change that led uh, to know that place to us all. Good afternoon to you all. It's a great honor to be here this afternoon representing this city. I've been there for seven years in Central Africa, and I spent three years in Bangui. So I'm here not only on behalf of myself, but on behalf of my church, my community, and the refugees that for three years have been living around our church. On Friday, when I started my journey from Bangui, refugees immediately understood that my travel was extraordinary. Usually, I only travel to Italy every two years. So they immediately understood there was something important there. That's why somebody wanted to clean my sandals so that I could present myself in a tidy way here at this meeting. They don't know what this meeting about. They will know that when I come back. But I appreciated such contribution. Such a simple person immediately understood how important was this meeting. This afternoon, I would like to tell you a bit more about this country, and I would like to tell you about the uh, intention of our Pope. He gave us a great gift. Central African Republic is uh, unfortunately an unlucky place. It's not really the central part of Africa. It's a country, as you can see from the map located in the very heart of Africa, in Tsango language. The name is uh, Beafrica, heart of Africa. This country does exist. It's twice as big as Italy. Unfortunately, it has many paradoxes. It's a big country, but with only 5 million inhabitants that are located mainly in the western part of the country. The Central African Republic is uh, one of the poorest countries in the world. I believe it ranks among the last three. Nevertheless, it contains gold, oil, uranium, and agriculture could yield very good results indeed. Unfortunately, this country has been damned to underdevelopment. This country is a very young country. More or less 50% of the population uh, has less than uh, 18, is less than 18 years old. So around 70 to 80% of people is very young. Life expectation is about 51 years old and illiteracy is very high, 40%. And strangely enough, young generations are suffering from the bad um, government rules that led to illiteracy. So it is um, an unlucky country. This country over the last three years has tackled a war. And I believe that now, once and for all, we have the chance to let this country exit this uh, situation of poverty and underdevelopment. Very shortly, I will try to tell you how this war started. Wars are very often very complex. 
We've been studying about wars, but once you live them in the first person, you immediately realize how complex are their causes and how difficult it is to put an end to such wars. Well, such a big country had a government that couldn't really control the whole of its territory. From the north part, uh, neighboring with Chad, a group of rebels merged together in a union, SLK, that means alliance in the local language, tried to bring forward their ideas. The president didn't pay attention to the situation, and the situation worsened a lot. Therefore, such coalition went downwards in a year and reached the capital city neighboring Congo. So the government underestimated this alliance, and this alliance wanted to uh, come into power. In that area, richness is very high because there are a lot of resources. In 2013, a coup d'etat took place, and the situation was out of control. The majority of people were Muslims, and uh, towns were burnt down, violences and rapes took place, and missions were also um, witnessing such actions by the rebels. After that, power uh, tried in December 2013 to uh, turn back the situation. Bangui was conquered once more by the Christian majority, and a civil war sparked a very uh, violent uh, Many people were killed, and this occurred over the months. That's where our adventures started, as you've uh, witnessed from our pictures here. On the 5th of December, well, I am a teacher, and I teach in Bangui. So we were about to start and going to school. We heard some shootings. We've heard such shootings during the morning mass. And we've witnessed people flowing towards our convent. So we informed ourselves and heard that in the main seminary, the situation was similar. People were flowing more and more. and. In the afternoon, we immediately noticed that that people was increasing in numbers and they didn't want to come back to their homes. So in the evening time, we let them enter the internal garden of the convent, 300 people. The, day, the following day, the people increased even more. And on the 6th of December, the number raised to 1,000. People. We counted that people very discreetly just to have an idea and to inform our community about the fact that 2,000 people were uh, staying at our convent. We understood that something new was happening. We've never witnessed something similar. So we had to manage such situation. It was something similar to a refugee camp, but we didn't even realize that. After some years, now we know that was a refugee camp. Back then, we didn't have food for such a huge number of people. Therefore, we tried to nourish them in the best way we could, and mainly we focused our attention on children. These pictures are about the first days. 
the battle went on and around 2021 20, of December, well, we heard in the morning that shootings were really loud. We've seen more and more people adding up and in the evening and the following morning we gave an estimate number of people. The number of refugee was over 10,000. So we thought 2,000 was a lot, but probably that was just uh, the beginning. We had to manage that people. We asked ourselves, are we up to this task? Well, I think we managed to handle the situation and receive suggestions. During a week, we just stayed, as I'm describing right now, no external support, and we tried to internally organize ourselves. We didn't know what was happening inside the city, and we didn't know what happened in other convents and uh, churches. So the question would be, where did you put 10,000 people inside a convent, which is not as big as a Rimini Fiera? I think it's one-fourth of this room. Well, the first 2,000 people were located everywhere we could inside the convent. Just our rooms were uh, free from refugees. We put them in garages and gardens. People wanted to have a shelter, and most of all, young people were afraid to be killed. Afterwards, we used the church itself. The weather was rainy, therefore we tried to find sheltered places and decided to also allow refugees to enter the church and mothers with child entered the church. When we had to decide where to locate this place, after a few months, UNICEF wanted to build seven classrooms. The only available place was the football court. Therefore, my brothers protested, well, it's OK. I'm OK with the allowing people to enter the church, but I won't allow people to enter the football court. So we are one of the few refugee camps in Bangui with a football court. And that because we didn't put any tent inside that. In other places, other convents um, allowed refugees to enter those courts after the uh, request from UNICEF. We've also supported sick people that needed care. At the beginning, we provided, we supplied some medications. We had a friend of ours that was a physician. We had to tackle malaria, but we immediately understood that we had so many sick people around, and we said we must do something. We eliminated tables from the canteen and decided to eat in an internal corridor. That canteen turned into an hospital. Day by day, we realized that we had to meet those people's needs. Then other physicians came. We had four physicians, four nurses, and four uh, people supporting the nurses. Our hospital was a 24 hours a day hospital. Those people were also wounded. You can easily imagine, imagine that when People must leave their houses due to a fire or just because they're afraid. Well, that people run very fast. So many people felt on the ground. And I remember this person with an injury. I phoned the hospital asking for an ambulance for this person. And the 
physician said, well, at the moment, we only accept people wounded by knives or bullets. You have to help ourselves in that case. So we had to also take care of um, the health care situation of those refugees. Moreover, the fertility rate of African females is very high, and in spite of bombings or mm, difficult situations, deliveries were numerous. Many women were coming to the last months of their pregnancies, and I can remember this episode. We received three boxes. The boxes contained everything that was useful for emergency deliveries. I laughed because I thought this will be useless. But after a month, we had to ask for more boxes because the material contained in those boxes was not enough for the number of deliveries that we had to follow. We had a number of uh, mothers that had to give birth to their child. You've seen a picture uh, of um, a delivery inside the church because we didn't have the time to bring the baby and the mother inside the canteen. Well, African women actually were supported by a nurse all the time. When I studied theology, I've never heard about such things, and I learned so many things in that occasion. Well, I would also mention Providence. Uh, two months earlier, well, I arrived in Bangui on uh, August 2013, and a young person asked to enter the um, Kameli, Carmelites as a nurse. I had to follow this person, and then a delivery occurred. We were just uh, uh, myself and him. And I followed him during this delivery that was very successful indeed. This was a beautiful experience. Uh, around 30 babies were born inside the convent. And when we had 10,000 people, it was just unthinkable to host them inside the convent. So they had to sleep outside in February. After two months, we've built some tents using branches of trees, and then we also received plastic um, covers that allowed us to build tents. So, moreover, we also had to feed these people and to give water to them. In addition, we also had to ensure hygienic conditions. I would like to remember that Ebola was uh, uh, spreading around Africa in that period, so the risk of contagions was very high. My brother Friars had to dig holes so that people could use those holes as toilets in order to avoid contaminations. Among 10,000 people, epidemies can spread very quickly indeed. We um, set up very strict rules because we didn't want to die from SLK and we didn't want to die from cholera, neither. One of my friends said, did you uh, went to the military uh, before being a friar? Well, no, but when talking about hygienic um, uh, conditions, you have to be very strict. We just had a small epidemia among children, but we um, managed to finish the, the, the situation very successfully. We also managed to provide food to the people. My friends, friars, cooked all the time to give food to children. Yet, 
we didn't expect 2,000 people to sit around the table. So the first, the very first help that we received came from a dear friend, a Muslim, that wasn't able to come to visit us. An enclave of Muslim people was created in the capital city where Christians were not able to enter and Muslim could not exit. In spite of that, this friend wanted to send us rice, sugar, and oil. Well, Jesus multi multiplied everything. We didn't manage to do something similar, but we achieved good results. The Red Cross trucks came, international trucks came, and in the morning, three big lorries were unloaded and the material deposited inside a room. The Red Cross then left. So it was up to us to distribute this material to 10,000 hungry people. We've thought about many different solutions. I was very stubborn on that occasion. I wanted to create lines. I wanted to select women first. We were talking about 2,000, 3,000 women, but putting hungry women in line is not that easy. It's impossible. So I immediately gave up that possibility. People were complaining and all that. So we thought some more about a different measure. We divided the refugee camp into 12 different, let's say, neighborhoods. We carried out a census in order to understand how many families there were, and we wanted them not to cheat. We created a list and divided the material according to the different neighborhoods. So uh, we had tons of materials. We had oil, rice, salt. The material was there, and we asked the, let's say, chief of that neighborhood to come and load a tractor with that material. That material then reached the neighborhood, and that material had to nourish zone one, zone two, etc. On Once the tractor arrived in the specific zone, one of our colleagues followed the distribution of the material. The first time, it took three days, and we were exhausted at the end of the day. But little by little, we improved, and in half a day, we managed to distribute everything. That was an experience for us. We committed some errors, yet we improved in time. We wanted to let them distribute the material, but uh, robberies were numerous, so we managed the thing ourselves. And refugees were happy about that situation because the right and even quarter arrived to each refugee. So each 15 days, the load arrived, and we had to manage that load of foodstuff. At the moment, we only have 3,000 refugees. That might seem a lot to you, but if compared to 10,000, well, that's a normal number. 7,000 people came back to their homes. So when I walk in the city center, they immediately notice myself and they say, well, I slept in zone five. I slept in the Carmelite uh, church. I am a white person, so uh, if they give me their son and uh, make a joke about the uh, fatherhood, well, that cannot be a mistake. My, my skin color, 
is uh, very um, clear. We never left them and uh, lived together such a difficult situation. On the 14th of October 2014, that was the eve of St. Therese. On that day, we were wondering about the gift that we had to give to St. Therese. After singing some holy songs, uh, there was this father coming to us and accompanying a pregnant women. We wanted to take the women to the hospital. And my dear friends said, uh, let's call this child Saint Therese. So we reached the hospital, and during the night, the a woman gave birth to a son, uh, um, a child. The father was very happy, and he wanted me to give a name to the child. He said, it's the ninth son that I have, so I will give up the opportunity to give a name to this child. And since you suffered with me to, uh, ho to help the mother delivering the child, you will have the chance to give the name to this child. I wanted to call him Joseph because Therese was devoted to Joseph, and uh, Joseph was also the name of my father. So uh, I actually gave many nephews to my father in Central Africa in this way. One more episode that I would describe as a beautiful episode, a miracle for my uh, f brothers and I. Christmas 2013 was unforgettable. We gave mass at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We couldn't give our mass uh, at noon at midnight, sorry, because the uh, battle was uh, rampaging around. It was beautiful to see that this people was shaking and shivering, but they were not going away from the mass. We exchanged many gifts, and after a while, in December, Christmas was coming again, and we wanted to give a gift to every child. We calculated that there were at least 1,500 people that had less than 10, that were less than 10 years old. So the question was, uh, what gift shall we give to those child? Because we didn't have any means. We asked some organization if they could provide some chocolate, sugar, or milk to, let's say, celebrate Christmas. On the 24th of December at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, two very big cars arrived, a well-dressed couple of men approached, and they unloaded five big boxes from the cars. They told us that those boxes contained 1,600 toys for our children. That was exactly the, na the number of uh, toys we needed. Well, I don't know who these people were. So we didn't know who sent those toys. So we believed it was the providence that let our dreams came come true. The problem then was how to distribute those gifts. It was the afternoon of uh, December 24th. We had quite a, an experience. And I then remembered 
the meeting held in 1996. I was 18 years old. I was among the audience back then. And I saw that when an important person, an important speaker was there, there were some voluntary people that arranged a kind of uh, chain around this person. I liked that system. It was an efficient system to take that important people somewhere. So we decided to divide in 12 parts these toys. Each friar received a couple of bags containing toys for each neighborhood and zone within the refugee camp. Then we asked people of 20 years old to create this chain around us. The community was inside, and this young people protected us. As soon as the child would have understood that toys were in those bags, they would assault us, so we wanted to protect ourselves. So we exited the church, and carrying a statue of a baby Jesus, we organized a stroll around the neighborhoods inside the refugee camp. And in one hour time, we managed to distribute that number of toys. So as you can see, meeting is also useful to uh, this type of purposes. This applause is also aimed to voluntaries. I would like to ask you one more question. Did it come to your mind or to your brother's mind? A question like this. Why should I tackle such difficulty? I'm not able to do that. So why did you just uh, behaved in that way? Well, I don't really feel we behaved in some way. We had open doors and people just came. Then things followed. And when we understood we were dealing with 10,000 people, we did not really panic, but asked ourselves, are we able to manage this situation? Well, the answer was, yes, we managed the situation up until now. We did some mistakes, acquired experience. Let's try to solve the situation and manage it. We did not repent of what we did, nor we thought we did something extraordinary. We just were able to behave in a good way, and luckily we achieved good results. And while this was happening, uh, there were still shootings outside. Uh, as you were saying before, there was an enclave and and at some point, surprisingly, Pope decided uh, to come there. And so what happened? Something extraordinary, completely unexpected happened. I uh, remember the moment uh, when Pope was coming back from Philippines, I think, and he announced that he was uh, going to come to uh, uh, Central Africa. And, and he really he was really talking about Bangui, and it was I was really surprised, and so were my brothers, my uh, brethren. And the Pope did not only want to come there, but he also wanted to start a week before the here the Holy Year of Mercy in Bangui. And I must admit that maybe um, I wouldn't have advised the Pope to come there because in that country, even now, there is no army, uh, there are no, uh, there is no, there are no police. And so uh, th there was a matter with uh, the Pope's safety and security and also for the people who would have come there. 
And uh, uh, the day before the arrival of the Pope, uh, there were still uh, shootings, and we had 7,000 refugees in our convent. Uh, luckily, uh, he listened to uh, the bishop of uh, Bangui and uh, Monsignor Coppola, who strongly believed in the visit of the Pope because they thought they could make it. Even though there were problems connected to the arrival of the Pope, well, he said that he was more afraid of mosquitoes and of malaria than other problems there. And secondly, that uh, uh, he would have come to Central Africa even uh, using a parachute. Uh, so he arrived in uh, Uganda and uh, um, he decided to come there. The visit went very well and they congratulated us for the organization. But we didn't do anything special. The Pope just saw what uh, we did every day. And, and then in the cathedral of Bangui, the holy door was opened. And at that moment, I was there in the cathedral. And I was afraid that the Pope opened the door uh, the other way around. Uh, uh, so opening the door towards the square. Instead, uh, the door was opened towards the uh, in interior of the church. And then in Italian, he said for three times, Bangui is becoming the spiritual uh, capital of the world. Uh, so that was a very extraordinary moment. And we didn't know that he uh, would have said that. Many people ask me, what does it mean? What does spiritual capital mean? Maybe we should ask the Pope. But I think that to me and to my brethren and people in Central Africa, in the Central African Republic, uh, what is important is that uh, the Central African Republic is used to being among the last, so not having such an importance. And when someone told us, you are the spiritual capital of the world, we said, wow, that's a wonderful thing because we cannot be an economic capital or a political capital, but we can be a spiritual capital. So for once in life, for some days, uh, we were able to feel mm, stronger, not weak, as uh, we usually do. It was like the Pope say, come and come higher. It was like saying that we were the last. And the Pope knew it, so he wanted to do something for us. For sure, we lived this experience. And it was like a commitment that was given to us by the Pope. So we will try to do our best. For sure, there's a first uh, positive result, that is that the world has realized that the Central African Republic is a real country and a real church. So this is a very important result. And after the visit of the Pope, the perspective has radically changed. We went out of a standstill, and we really felt like we couldn't make it uh, with no hopes, um, because civil wars have uh, aff afflicted Central Africa for uh, several years. There were missions, uh, supports by the United Nations, by other countries, but nothing uh, had changed. Instead, after the Pope's visit, we really felt a new enthusiasm, a new way to look at things, a new perspective. And we started to think we can make it, and we hope 
we will make it. Shootings uh, are less now. There are just a few episodes, but the situation has really improved and the Pope's visit and his presence, uh, not only his words, really uh, helped changing the general atmosphere. Uh, so a whole country and uh, the Christian community felt that something new was about to start. We saw here the Pope uh, getting on the car with the Imam and going beyond the uh, kilometer five, so entering the zone where they were shooting just before. What did you think when uh, you saw him doing this? What did you think about this gesture? Well, I think that the Pope was very brave uh, because that area uh, is a an area where generally uh, people don't go through um, it's to go to the mosque and the Muslims in the neighborhood really welcomed him and they were happy with his visit so they wanted to act as uh, guards for the Pope and even the Christians were surprised by their decision. It was like opening up uh, a new uh, way of living together in this country. And I hope that uh, this was uh, a very um, important action, a gesture that made something else change. Because generally when there is a war, vengeance sorry, revenge, is the main feeling. Instead, what the Pope did was like saying, we need someone who says no. No, I don't want any revenge. And uh, no, I don't want any violence. And, and in the previous months when in, in the months, in the following months, sorry, uh, there were people killed, but uh, what the Pope did really helped changing the perspective. And instead, inside the Carmel Convent, uh, what changed in your relationships and in the relationships you have with the people you host there? Uh, for sure, we weren't used to live in such a situation. I remember that we gathered, we met, and we said, we can do two things. Either we send them away, either we go away. So we didn't really want to send them away. Maybe when we get really angry, uh, we could think it. Uh, and But um, we, we didn't want it, really. And so we decided that we had to live with them. And since we felt very nostalgic of our life, because for several weeks uh, we worked at every moment of the day, so we wanted to do what we did uh, because, uh, for example, during night we went to sleep with our clothes on because we were ready to act if we needed it. But we, at the end, we found uh, those important spaces that we needed, uh, moments to pray, to meditate, and we realized that it was possible to join both our needs and the needs of the refugees that were there. For example, today we have time to pray in the morning or late in the afternoon. Uh, we can eat together. And we realized that even refugees were aware of our needs. And they've always been very respectful. They know that they can interrupt us during our prayers only if there's 
someone dying or uh, there's someone arriving, so a birth. Only in those cases they call us and we go them there and help them. What I can say is that for for us and other friars, uh, the most important thing is the prayer. And I've never thought that what I was doing was against uh, the idea I had in the past and the need to pray. Uh, at the end, we were able to find a good compromise, so to say, a different lifestyle or a modus vivendi. And in the evening, for example, uh, it's the moment where the refugee camp uh, uh, accepts more people because they come back. But we pray. We can pray and we are not disturbed by the noise uh, they make. It's like sort of uh, background music accompanying our prayer. And so I think that it really uh, even helps our prayer. You repeat it several times that these guests are a gift that we cannot waste. What does it mean? It means that these guests forced us to live and respect the Gospels. Uh, Jesus is there uh, very close and so it would have been stupid to miss this occasion. It is also true that we were very tired, for sure. But then, when you have time to recover, you understand that this is a unique opportunity. And we were sure that that was the right way to do. There are not many people that wake up in the morning and say, OK, I'm doing the right thing. The life I'm living is right. Well, we had this great opportunity to say this is the right thing we are not making any mistake and we can go on as we have done up to now we were supported by many many friends that we even didn't even know before that was so that were supporting us and encouraging us that's why we said that that was a chance an unmissable chance and before, you said that you are winners. So what does that mean? And what does that change for you? Well, the Pope said that, talking to young people during the wake. And so the Pope asked to work for peace and to forgive. So I, this, this is the meaning, to be the winners, to uh, win over uh, the evil. In the Central African Republic, there are m many people saying that um, rebels should lay down their weapons, but the first thing to do would be not to eliminate weapons, but to instill that idea in the minds of rebels. So I think that that was what the Pope uh, really meant. And for sure, he talked to young people, since young people represent almost 80% of the population. Because young people in Central Africa are not the future, they are the present. I work generally with young people and I always repeat, do not hold the other guilty for what happens. No. The fault is not on others. You should learn to say it's up to us. If I change, the country will change. And we 
that they should not um, accept some proposals that are uh, not uh, genuine because they have been cheated too many times in Africa. And generally, I uh, draw a comparison between Italy after the Second World War, uh, where people had to completely rebuild the country and there were excellent people who made big changes and will live in a beautiful country, in a democratic country, thanks to them. And by chance, I'm experiencing, I'm going through this same period in Central Africa where young people have to rebuild, well, not really rebuild, but build for the first, build for the first time a country. So there's a lot uh, to build from scratch. And that's a great responsibility, but also a great honor for me uh, to support these young people for the history of their country. Another couple of questions. The, per the first is about young people. Uh, first, about novices, uh, because you teach them, and so how many students do you have? Uh, luckily, there are many, and some refugees are also um, uh, deciding to, uh, to to join us. And in September, I think there will be 11 people, like a football team. So that's why you decided to leave the football court there. But uh, hearing that for you, hearing uh, those things from people, uh, from these students, from these novices, um, what does it mean for you? They were very positively impressed and they were surprised uh, of seeing the Pope and they realize something like we exist. Uh, we can be good for the church, for the Pope, for the Pope, for the world. So I saw them changing. I saw them not just complaining about the bad they had, but encouraging to change. Well, I remembered listening to you the, his, the story of Alain. Can you tell this? Well, this is the last but one question. There's a very beautiful story about Alain, who is 22 years old is from Central African Republic. He arrived to Carmel Convent. Uh, he didn't even know that it existed. And he found his family there. He couldn't find the family anymore. And he slept for several weeks on the ground in front of the door of the convent. And I noticed that every morning he came to Mass. There were many people coming to Mass, for sure, but this young um, boy was very interested in it. And I think it was in February, so about three months after his arrival, he asked me to talk. I wondered uh, why. So we sat down and he said, Father, I would like, be, I would like to be like you. And uh, I thought, well, maybe even better than me, I hope. But he was really um, fascinated, uh, was really attracted by what we did, how united we were, and how we uh, worked and prayed. And uh, he asked me what type of book I had in my hands. And uh, I said that I had a uh, breviary. And uh, he was very, very interested uh, in what we did. Well, uh, I remember something saying that uh, uh, a person who wants to become a friar or a monk should uh, stay for five days in front of the door of a convent. Well, Alain stayed there for three months, so he is the right candidate. 
and he really wants to become a novice, uh, but he hasn't had a real chance up to now. He is very intelligent, very sensitive, sensitive, and I hope uh, he can make it. So I will let you know what happens next. So the last, the very last question for you. This invitation to conver conversion uh, of the Pope, what does it really mean? It means that we cannot say that conversion is something that we can do once for all. It also means to accept what happens and what we do not expect. I can say that the most beautiful things that have changed me in my life and have made me happier and maybe more Christian uh, were the unexpected things, the things that I didn't want. And these things have changed me a lot despite my personality. Um, I hope that these changes have made me a better person doing something better for the Lord and for the others. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that uh, Father Federico's smile, together with his words, are the most beautiful testimony and evidence showing the importance of what Pope Francis did. As you can see, On that day, in front of that holy door, the whole situation developed. There's a moment before the holy door and the moment after that holy door. As Father Federico said, after that moment, shootings stopped. On the evening before, shootings were ravaging, but from then onwards, something happened. Something is happening. Humanity is regenerating. And we've heard him describing such transformation very well. So there is a moment before and after. This is really taking place. It's not a problem, a promise. It's not something virtual. We've witnessed this change. We've seen the door opening. It's not really that problems disappeared. Problems are there. But there's another atmosphere, another attitude, a behavior that is an opening towards another human being. We are acknowledging that the other human being is a good. Problems were not solved, yet that door opened by the Pope, and as you've seen from the pictures, well, the, the team of uh, Father Federico is really um, a beautiful team. On that night, 600 people knocked on the door asking for refugee. Well, that opened door is not magically changing the situation, yet it says to us all that In our current reality, there is a place welcoming you and providing love in spite of the evil, in spite of sins. 
in spite of the misery we represent and problems we face. The mercy of God is there. It's tangible. And if we are available to acknowledge such fact, if we witness that and we've stuck, we're stuck by that situation. If Alain says, I would like to be as you are, well, we can understand how we are always provided with the possibility to change the door opened by Pope Francis, the door of a Bangui open, uh, the Bangui convent means that there is, there are open arms that are available to welcome you. If we are willing to convert, to accept those beautiful things that I rejected so far. So let's be willing to be loved and be surrounded by mercy. This door has been opened and God will decide for us as he always does. The Pope's gesture calls upon our attention to acknowledge that Central Africa has become the spiritual capital of the world. Mercy is something real. Just say yes to love. Thank you. Have a successful meeting. Please allow me to just remind you of the fact that this place lives and works thanks to the contribution of us all. The fundraising campaign uh, still goes on inside the meeting. You can always donate here so that a place, something like this, can exist in time. Thank you.